Okay, so hopefully you guys all got your Wi-Fi uh, worked out. Um, so with that, let's get into intro to databases. Um, before we actually talk about databases, let's talk about again how to navigate through workshops. So remember when you're using workshops, you want to close out of any unsafe files uh, when you like get the latest like to catch up and you want to run git fetch to get any information like the latest information in case we made any changes to the workshop branch and then you want to hit get reset dash dash hard to clear your changes and revert to the original workshop and then run npm start to run start up your server and in a separate terminal you want to run npm run hot loader to start up your front end right so to start up your web app, you need two terminals, one terminal for the server, which is npm start, and another terminal for the front end, which is npm run hot loader. And as always, if there's any error, um, please, please, please ask on Piazza, um, raise your hand, or put your questions on the questions stack, or add yourself on the queue. We will definitely try to help. But before we talk into databases, um, let's kind of Review again, like the overarching idea of what the relationship between the front end and back end is. And so, again, you as a user, you're like browsing the web and maybe you're browsing capbook.com. And what you see on the screen, what's displayed on the screen, is a result of what we call the front end. And so, the front end is just code that's responsible for displaying what's in front of you. Right? It's not really like the one responsible for getting the information to display in front of you. It's the one that's just really in charge of like displaying things and maybe also taking in any like information that you as a user input, right? Through like keys and whatnot. And so this front end includes things like your React components and the HTML, CSS, et cetera. Right? Everything that like you've been working on in like the first three days. Of lecture. But the front end, as I said, its main job is to just display things and maybe like take in any information that it gets. Any... Okay, it just takes out any information that it gets from like, the users and sends it to like some like known entity of the application, right? Like, um, what I mean by that is if you call in CapBook, right, like you have users like typing on their computers to input like what they want to post. And so front end takes that text, it doesn't actually process it by itself, it sends it to some entity um, to, be, to let that entity process. And so like the brains of our application, that like mystery entity is what we call the back end, right? Like the back end is the code working behind the scenes responsible for giving front end that information it needs to display and updating any new information it gets from front end. And again, front end and back end, they communicate in the form of what we call HTTP requests. And in this class, we'll be using two main kinds of HTTP requests. The first kind is what we call a get request. And this is where the front end tells the back end, say, hey, give me information on this something, something. And then in response, the back end will send to the front end, hey, here's the information that you requested on this something, something. And the other type of request that we will be using a lot in this course is what we call a post request. And in a post request, the front end tells the back end, say, hey, here's the new information on this something, something. And because of uh, and like after that, the backend will like do whatever it wants with that information, right? So it can maybe like update some internal state. Or in today's case, which we'll be learning, it's probably doing something with the database, right? It's maybe like making changes to the database, um, adding something to the database, or deleting something from the database, whatnot. And in this case, since like the backend is really just changing. Hello, testing. Oh. 
it was better. Okay, yeah, so I think it is. Um, but yeah, so like the back end will just take in that new information and it will like, do whatever it needs to it. And since it's not really like, giving anything back to like the front end, like there's not really any need to like give a response to the front end, but you can. Like you can maybe like send back to the front end like the thing that you just created, right? But it's not really necessary. Like in a post request, what's the most important is that the front end just sends some information to the back end. But like, um, so here's like an overview of what we just talked about. But like how does like the front end specify like what kind of information it's giving to the back end and what kind of information it wants from the back end, right? Like how does the front end specify the something something? And how does the back end kind of know what to do when the front end like request the something something and how how does the back end know what kind of data to give back to the front end, right? This is what is defined by an API endpoint, which specifies what kind of input the endpoint takes and the output that it should send back, right? And so in general, you want to think of an API endpoint as just like a black box function where the input parameters and the output responses are specified. And kind of moving away from the front end and the back end kind of model that we just talked about. In the terms of the in context of API endpoints, we use the two terms client and server, right? So the client is the entity that uses or calls the API endpoint, and the server is the entity that provides or like defines the API endpoint. Um, this is the case because sometimes like your backend or what we usually call server can be a client of like another server. Um, so take the example of a music recommendation web app that utilizes Spotify API. So in this case, there's actually two client server relationships. The first one is our standard front end backend, which usually will always be the case, where the front end is the client and the backup is the server. But there's another additional client server relationship where your back end is now the client of the Spotify's like API server, right? Spotify will have like computers that like this are responsible for like, dealing with all of these API Spotify API requests. And those are the server in like the second relationship. Like our, your back end for this music recommending app will call Spotify's API. So that your back end will be the client to the Spotify APIs like the servers. Okay. And to kind of go over this in more depth, so from like the client side or like the API user side, an API endpoint is again, just like a black box function with specified inputs and outputs. So in the context of a GET request, the API endpoint specifies what query parameters the client should send to the server. And it also specifies what kind of information or like what format the information um, the, the client should expect as a response from the server, right? So maybe, so in our like Slack stories example, like our client should expect a list of story objects from the server, so something like that. And in the context of a post request, an API endpoint specifies what kind of updated information or like what form the information should take, the client should send to the server. And from the server or the API provider's end, uh, perspective, the, it's basically like the code for the function. Right? The API endpoint is like just the code for the function. It is the function that will be called when the client makes the API. Uh, makes the request to the API endpoint. And so essentially this means that it's like the code that defines the inputs and the outputs of an API endpoint. And it also defines how inputs will be handled and how outputs are obtained, right? So this code, it specifies like what happens when like the client gives the um, server that information. And maybe how does the server kind of get the information that the client requested? Maybe like through calling a database, like when today, or maybe it's like calling an external API, like maybe like Spotify's API. So however, like the server is getting the information for the client, that's like uh, defined inside the API endpoint inside the server. 
And so inside a get endpoint, you should expect to have code that decides how the server gets the information requested by the client. And inside the post endpoint, you should expect code that defines how the server handles the information provided by the client. Okay, so let's just go over like the flow of like, what happens when you make an API request to an external API, so let's like, say Spotify. So again, you have your front end, your back end, and your external API, um, which is like you can think of just like a set of API endpoints provided by like a company or like someone, um, which like you can use for your own applications. Right? And in this case, our external API is Spotify's API. And say you want to get the songs. So your front end calls the back your back end's API. So this is your front end talking to your back end. And then your back end then calls Spotify's API via another get request using Spotify's like API, right? This API is specified by like Spotify. Spotify like tells us like what it wants for us to give it as inputs and what the back end should expect. And in this get request, the inputs and outputs are defined inside our back end. And in response, Spotify sends these songs. And maybe the back, your back end will like process it even more, or it might just send the song straight back. That all depends on what's the code inside the endpoint that you're having. And then the back end sends back whatever songs were processed back to the client. Okay. And so in the context of Catbook, just to maybe cement this in. So our Catbook server actually has five endpoints, which means that it's response to five types of requests from the client. So we have a get test stories comment and have a post story comment, right? It's actually get slash API, but yes. Okay, so in the context of a get request, again, we have our front end and back end. Our front end makes a get request to the back end, to the slash API slash stories endpoint. And um, then our back end acquires all the stories. Um, maybe it plays a database, which we'll be learning today, or for now it just like looks into its like stored variable and um, returns that. And then after our back end acquires all of the stories inside the code for the um, endpoint, it then sends all of the stories back to the front end as a response. And so in the code then, on the front end side, when you make a get request, you want to use the utility function that we provided in the code. And so you just call it get. You provide the endpoint that you want to hit. In this case, it's slash API slash comment. And then you maybe provide any like parameters that you want to give in order for the get request to um, work. Right? The parameters that you need to send are defined like by the back end code. Right? And in this case, we want to specify a parent, which is like the ID of the post or the story that the comment belongs to. And as a result, when we uh, make this get request, this goes into, this gets handled by this back end code in the api.js file. And essentially, um, this function inside router.get slash comment it gets called whenever the front end makes this get request to this endpoint, right? And what happens is the back end filters through its data for all of the, the comments that have the parent of the um, field specified. And then it sends all of the filtered comments back to the, um, the client, the front end. And so what's important here is to just note that when you make a get request on the front end side, you want to use this get method. And for the back end side, you want to put the code that um, handles this get request to this endpoint inside the router.get um, blah, 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 or that specific endpoint, right? And again, for a post request, um, when you make a post request, the front end sends a post request to the back end to like a given endpoint. And in this case, it's sending the content for a new story that it wants to add. Right? It's sending updated, updated information or information that it wants the back end to like handle. And then upon receiving this post request, our back end then adds the quote new story as a new story in wherever the stories are stored. Again, this may be in a database where 
um, or in like an internal state called like the data variable. And again, in terms of code for a post request, on the front end side, you want to use the utilities uh, um, post, post method that we provided in utilities.js. And this method takes in as input the endpoint that you want to hit, and also um, the, the end JavaScript object of what information you want to send to the back end. And again, the format of the information, um, so like the keys and the values, are determined by the back end. Right? The back end specifies what um, kind of information it wants from the front end for this endpoint. And when we make this post request, this gets handled by the router.post um, like method for the slash comment endpoint, right? And upon receiving it, um, the back end creates a new comment, and then it adds this comment to its data. For now, it's like just a um, local variable, and it's and in this case, it sends back the new comment to the uh, front end. But this last part is unnecessary since like you don't really need to like send things in a post request. But yes. Okay, so now let's actually talk about databases. So again, we have our client server model, and when we post a new story to the server, um, the server adds a new story, uh, but a new story in which all the stories are stored. And as mentioned before, right now the server stores the data locally as a variable in this like data variable, right? But what's wrong with storing data in the server as a variable? So let's just think about like when we have a lot of clients and they're all making post requests. The first one maybe wants to add like hi. The second one wants to add hello. And maybe one day things go wrong and the server crashes. And you wait and you wait um, the server's down, you wait a long time and your service back up right and maybe this is a good news but it turns out that all your data is lost and we don't really want that to happen so it turns out that your server um like resets the data like your, the data that's stored inside the server as like a local variable gets reset whenever your server restarts and your server restarts whenever you close the terminal, modify your server code, or when your server crashes, or if your laptop runs out of battery. And in all of these cases, all of your data is gone. And that's not good, right? Because you want these stories and the comments to persist regardless of anything you do um, and any kinds of failure. And even if we assume that the server never restarts or the server like never fails, um, when you have like thousands and thousands of users and you eventually want to store like gigabytes and ton, tons and tons of data, you end up running out of memory because data is just stored on your local computer, right? And so this is not a scalable option either. So so the first thing is we need to store our data permanently so that even if our server fails um, or even if our server restarts, right, the data persists. And we can do this by putting it onto the hard disk, maybe in the form of, say, data.txt, a file. And so now whenever we want to read data, we just um, load in data from data.txt. And whenever we want to save data, we just save data uh, by writing the data to data.txt. And so again, like when in our server, then whenever we want to add a new story, in addition to adding it to the data local variable, we just write it to the data file so that this data just persists, persists. And whenever we load from file, we first read the data from file and then um and we do this whenever the server starts up and then whenever we want to send the stories we just send it back uh, via our local variable since our local variable also gets like updated whenever we like 
um, to be stories with a post request. And so maybe we think that we've actually solved the problem, which is great, right? But there actually turns out to be something wrong with data.txt as well. And so it turns out that it takes a long time to actually write the data and like save the story and comment, right? Whenever someone posts. And it takes still takes up a lot of memory, like because we're still storing the data in the data variable. Um, we're still keeping all of our stories and comments in our memory, which will eventually run out when we have too many users and too much data. And it's also slow to actually look for specific data points um, or specific like stories or comments, right? Because um, this is like doing like a linear search through all of the stories. So then if we have like a billion stories, it's gonna take a long time relatively. And um, additionally, if your laptop hard drive breaks, which is where like the, uh, hopefully like the data is supposedly persists, we're still kind of doomed. And additionally, there's also concurrency issues, right? So like what happens when two users posts at the exact same time. Do their posts get jumbled up? Um, do they get scattered around? But we wanna make sure that when two users post at the same time, either user A's story comes first and then user B's, or user B's comes completely first and then user A's. We don't want those um, stories to be kind of like jumbled up, right? And it turns out that it's also unsafe to use the, um, to write to a file multiple times on the same file without waiting for the callback. So there's like a ton of things wrong with data.txt. And the reason uh, or how we fix these issues is it turns out that all of these problems actually have been solved for us. Like we actually don't need to worry about this ourselves because the there are these things called databases, which exist, and they are worked on by thousands of individuals to actually solve these problems, right? And these include things like MySQL, SQLite, Postgres, and MongoDB, which is what we'll be using today and for WebLab. And so uh, what is a database? A database is an organized collection of data that's generally optimized and very proof. Um, and Relatedly, a database management system, or DBMS, is like a collection of functions that let you kind of interact with the database. So it lets you do things like getting data, adding data, updating data, and deleting data. But TLDR, you can think of a database as just data.txt but better, and a DBMS as just read and write data from file but better. Right, because it's worked on by thousands and thousands of people um, as they're like real life job. And so, how do we read from a database? What happens is your server says, tells the um, interacts with the database through the DBMS. Right, you can think of our server being like a person and the database being kind of like a storage warehouse. And the DBMS is like a mailman. And so your server is just telling the DBMS, give me the stories from like this warehouse. The DBMS will go to the database, get the stories from the database that the server requested, take that story and bring it back to the server and then give it to the server. So essentially the server is just interacting with the database um, and basically like, telling what it wants from the database through this thing called the DBMS, right? Um, and so how do we write to the database? So similarly in the um, analogy for like a warehouse and mailman, our server tells the DBMS to put like a new story into the database, put this like new package into the warehouse. And then the DBMS delivery man um, takes the package, takes the data, and drops it off at the database. 
And so here's like some general pseudo code for like using a generic DBMS. Remember, DBMS is just like a set of functions that allow you to interact with the database, right? It allows you to like get data, add, uh, add data, um, delete data, update data, et cetera. So first you probably want to import the DBMS in some state or form. And then to read, you kind of use a read function provided by the DBMS and you specify what you want to read. Maybe you want to read all of the stories or maybe you want to like give it something to like narrow down what kind of data you want, right? Maybe you want, you only want the story with the ID of four, right? You want to like specify what kind of data you want. And you can also write to the database management system via like some write function that it provides. And you just tell it to write this something that you provided into the database. Or maybe you want to delete something. So in this case, you want to delete maybe all stories posted by Helen. Or maybe you tell it to update. So you can say maybe change the author of this story to Papa Shash. Um, but do note that this isn't real code, so don't actually try to run this. It's kind of just showing you that you can interact with the database using like functions provided by the database management system and right? using the read, write, delete, and update functions. And note that these also aren't really real functions. Like each DBMS has their own kind of like syntax for like these um, operations. So you just want to look at like how um, each of them do that, right? So this is just like pseudo code to give you guys like the general idea of what's going on. And so what kind of databases can we use? So there's actually two main kinds of databases out there right now. Um, there's what's called a relational database, which you guys may commonly know as SQL. And this stores data in a spreadsheet-like format. So we can think of it as just storing data in the forms of tables. And so you have like columns, that specify like the field that you want and like rows as data points. But um, there's also this other kind of database called a document database or a NoSQL database, which stores data in the form of what we call documents, which are basically just JSON objects. Right? And JSON objects are basically just like JavaScript objects. You have like keys, which are the attributes you want to have data on and values. So essentially it's just key value pairs. And so in this class, we'll be using um, a NoSQL database and hopefully you guys are all familiar with JSON since it's just very analogous to what JavaScript objects are. Right? It's just key value pairs. And so again, MongoDB is a NoSQL document database, which means that it stores data in the form of like JSON-like objects. So key value pairs. And an overall like architecture of MongoDB is we have our database. Let's say we have like cat book database. And data inside this database is organized into what we call collections. And collections essentially group together uh, data points that are of the similar that are of like similar structure, right? And in MongoDB, we call each individual like data point a document. So data is um, organized into documents, and documents are grouped together. Similar documents are grouped together into what we call collections. And there's multiple collections inside a single database. Right? And so in general, we'd ideally want like all of the uh, documents inside a given collection to like have the same format, right? And by that, I mean like have like the same keys and value types. And so now we're replacing data.txt and saying goodbye to MongoDB and its database management system. But if you notice here, we're still using this hard disk and um, it does MongoDB fix our issues. Well, it turns out that MongoDB is optimized for write speed, memory usage, query speed, and also solves all of the concurrency issues, right? And um, our hard drive though could still break, 
right? There's still the single point of failure because we, in that diagram, at least we were still using the hard drive. So as a result, instead, we could resort to the cloud and we can use what we call the MongoDB Atlas. And this essentially means that we are running MongoDB somewhere else, quote on the cloud. And why do we want to do this? This makes our life a lot easier because we don't need to run the database on our laptop. And uh, this allows the database to be managed for you and you can share the data with your teammates. And this is a lot more reliable than your laptop because MongoDB makes um, copies of your database such that even if one copy fails, right, you can still access your data from the other um, from the other like replicas, right? So it's failure proof essentially. So again, um, MongoDB is configured on what we call the Atlas. So like the MongoDB on cloud is like Atlas basically. And to get your data, then your server talks to MongoDB on Atlas over the network. And again, Atlas makes sure that you never lose data because it has multiple copies of the data, right? The same data is copied to multiple different machines such that even if one copy is uh, crashes, you can still access another copy, right? So it just means that it's very proof, right? Even if one copy is done, you can still access your data. And so let's just go into MongoDB Atlas to like kind of see what's going on. Okay, so if you like go into your Atlas, you can probably like open up Atlas. You can probably see like a cluster. And so capital right here is like a cluster. And um, the two main important things that you want to do with like a cluster is you first number one connect to your cluster. Right? You want to be able to use your database and connect to your database. And to do that, we want to press this connect button. And for our case, we want to connect to our application. And like you choose your um, server and the version. And what's important is you want to copy this um, SRV into your server.js. So inside server.js, there's actually a place for you to put your SRV. And this is the Mongo connection URL. All right, so eventually what you want to do is you want to copy this SRV into that Mongo connection URL. And you can think of this SRV as like a unique identifier for your cluster, for your database, um, that allows you to like connect to it, right? Because otherwise, like, how would you specify like which database inside the cloud that MongoDB cloud you want to connect to? So this thing is basically you can think of just like a unique identifier for your database. And you want to provide to it the username and the password. So you make sure to change the password. Right. So that was connecting to a database. The second most important thing you want to know about using cap, uh, not cap, but with Atlas, is uh, you want to actually be able to view the data. So to do that, you can uh, um, you can click onto the cluster. So I click on to cap up here. Okay, and it gives you several tabs. The most important tab is the collections tab. And so this, this is where like, all of your data is like located, where you can view all of your data. Right? So on the side here, we have like different databases. So each cluster is a collection of a bunch of different databases. So let's just take a look inside what the Catbook database looks like. So let's click on the Catbook database. And each database, as you can see, has um, several collections. And each collection, again, is just like a group or a set of related uh, documents, right? It's a set of documents or data points that have like similar structure that store like similar kinds of information, right? And in this case, we have four collections um one that stores like information on like the comments another that stores information on messages another that stores information on like the stories of our application and another that stores information about the users so let's just maybe go into the stories 
So inside here, then you're able to see all of the individual documents and their fields, right? Like we have an ID, parent ID, parent name, and content, and also a version. So this is just like how you navigate through like um, MongoDB on Atlas. You can like um, connect, you can get the key to connect to your database, and you can also like, actually view whatever stored inside your database, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So going back to the slide. So now I have like, um, with like databases kind of just fine. Let's put everything together, go back to the overarching picture and like see where our database kind of fits into like the front end, back end um, picture, right? So when we want to make the post request to like, um, oftentimes we just want to like create, update or delete data. And so we have our front end, our back end and our database. And again, a database is just a system that stores data in an organized manner. That's generally optimized and fairly proof. And um, it supports creation, reading, updating, and deleting of data via what's called the DBMS, right? And when we want to make a post request, our front end sends the back end um, something that it wants to create. In this case, it sends a post request to slash API slash stories with like the content of a new story it wants to add. And then our back end interacts with the database um, with the DBMS by adding the stories to the stories collection. All right. So um, this is not the exact syntax that you're supposed to be using. It's just like kind of pseudocode to maybe help you guys see what's going on. But basically, we use like um, an add method that's provided by the DBMS. Um, we specify like which collection that we want to add the data point in, and we give it the data. And in the context of a get request, right, um, the front end sends a get request to the back end via an API endpoint, in this case, slash API slash stories. The DBMS then, um, the back end calls the DBMS to find the stories, right? So basically, the back end is just interacting with the database through the DBMS. And then the database sends back the list of the stories to the back end which then sends back the list of these stories to the front end. It's also possible that in between, right, the back end does something to whatever it gets from the database um, before it sends, back to, sends it back to the front end. But in both the get request and the post request, um, the back end kind of serves as like a middleman between the front end and the database, right? The front end isn't the one that's talking to the database. It's the back end that's doing all of the heavy lifting. It's the back end that's like talking to the database and making sure that um, uh, it gets all of the information that the front end requested and it like updates any information that the front end sends to it. So in summary, Rather than storing our data on the server or in a text file, we can use a database to store our data. And in this class, we'll be using MongoDB as our database, and we will run MongoDB in the cloud using what we call Atlas. And so next step in our workshop, let's all write code with MongoDB, connect up our cap book with a database. Okay, let's go to the workshop. Okay, so for this workshop portion, let's first recap again what MongoDB is. So again, MongoDB is a document database, which means that it stores data in the form of JSON-like objects or like JavaScript objects. So you can think of it as just being key value pairs. And so an example would be something like this, right? You have three keys in this case, name, age, and hobby. So three fields. And each field has a value, right? The name has a value of Helen, age 20, hobbies is nothing and stacking. But why do we want to use MongoDBs when there's so many databases out there? 
LogMongoDB is efficient when we need to write a lot to the database, and the structure of the data is, and when the structure of the data is very prone to changes. And it's also relatively easy to use and learn within the short time. So you can think of a MongoDB instance as something analogous to like a storage facility where there's tons and tons of, of like storage units. And each storage unit or pod is analogous to like a database, right? And in general, you can think of like one database corresponding to like a single web application. Or like every single web app has its like own database in like our case. Um, right, so in Capbook, we don't have a separate database for stories and comments. They're all in a single database for Capbook, right? So you can think of it again, a database is just like one-to-one -one with like a web app. So each web app has a single database. And inside these storage uh, units, we have tons and tons of boxes. And in general, when we like put things into boxes, we put things like, we put similar things together. Right, so like these boxes inside these storage units are analogous to what we call collections in MongoDB. And uh, again, collections are just like a group of similar um, documents and like similar looking data. And inside these boxes, we have individual items. And in the MongoDB case, we have inside each collections, there's a lot of documents, which are basically just single data points. And each document may have fields. And what this means is that like maybe there's like attributes that you want to store, right? And so like the keys of the object. So like for the Shiva right here, maybe we want to store information about its color, its length, how poofy it is, or maybe how angry it is. Right, so all of these things are what we call fields, and each document stores values for each of these fields. Fields are just attributes in which we want to record data on. And so again, an overarching like view of like this, what the structure of MongoDB looks like is like we have like a storage facility. Inside the storage facility, we have like the storage units, and inside the storage units we have um, tons and tons of boxes which group together items of uh, that are very similar to each other. And inside the boxes, we have items. And each item, we classify it by um, its attributes or the fields. And so analogously, we have a MongoDB instance, which is just a collection of lots of databases. And each database is like just like um, one database puts on to like one web app, you can think in our case. And each database has a ton of collections that groups together um, similar documents. And each collection has like documents, which are just individual data points. And these documents are uh, have like fields, which are just like the attributes that we want to store data on. So this is just like MongoDB structure in words if you ever want to like go back and review. But since we already talked about it, let's just move on. Questions? No, no. Okay. Well, if you guys ever have any questions, please, please feel free to add them to the question box or raise your hand or put yourself on the queue and a staff member will go help. And with that, let's talk about Mongoose, which is like a Node.js library that allows us to use, uh, integrate our application with MongoDB. But more specifically, Mongo is just like a wrapper that allows you to interact with the MongoDB API. And it allows us to connect to a cluster and create documents and also interact with the databases. So like read, update, um, create, and delete, and also more. Okay. But why do we need Mongoose? Like why, why do why do we? Can't we just use the MongoDB API on its own? Why do we need this external wrapper Mongoose? It turns out that in vanilla Mongo, it doesn't guarantee that all documents in a collection have the same structure. So going back to like the storage facility and storage box analogy, let's say that in our database, we want for each box to have items that are all the same, right? We want to have just a box of nails. But 
the neural model allows us to maybe have boxes that have like nails and maybe like a random screwdriver. Or it allows us to have like boxes with just a jumble of like random things. Or you can have like a nail, light bulb, screwdrivers, etc. And so we don't want that. We want that all of our collections or all of our boxes to have the same, same items, to have documents of the same structure. And Mongoose lets us enforce this back, right? And it lets us enforce this via what we call schemas. So what is a schema? A schema defines the structure of your documents. It defines the keys and the types of the values corresponding to the keys, right? It defines what attributes you want to store data on and what are the types are, are each of the attributes, right? Um, is the attribute a string, integer, array, et cetera, right? And this is important because we really want to keep our database organized. If we have collections of like different structures, maybe like things might not work out as intended. So an example of a mongoose schema is as follows, right? The schema is just called schema and it has three keys, right? Three fields, a name field, which must be a string, an age field, which must be a number, and a hobbies field, which must be an array of strings, right? And in this case, this uh, possible data point is a name of Helen, age 20, hobbies, not the name stacking, right? So if we want to add a data point where maybe we have like a, field, a value that's of the wrong type, say like the name is like one, two, three, four, right? Like a number, one, two, three, four. Then when we try to add that into the database, Mongoose will say, no, I don't want that. That doesn't follow like the schema. Name must be a string. If it has like maybe like um, another additional key, maybe it has like, we want to add something with like name, age, hobbies, and maybe like say, uh, like nickname. Then when we try to add that into the database, Mongoose will also say, no, that's not allowed because what you can add must have uh, name, age, and hobbies, no more and no less, right? So Mongoose, um, basically through the use of schemas, enforces um, what structure the documents must have, what keys documents must have, and what kinds of values that um, could, the attributes could have, the fields could have. Um, and again, so schemas are a way for us to structure our MongoDB documents by specifying the fields that a document should have and also the type that each field should have. And as a result, we want each collection to have a schema. And right? so each schema, uh, each collection should have a schema. And so there's a bunch of different schema types that Mongoose provides, there's like string, number, date, buffer, boolean, mix, object ID, array, et cetera. You can read more about it um, on the Mongoose, uh, Mongoose.js uh, website if you are interested. But like these are generally like the main types that we'll probably use in this class. And another thing that Mongoose provides is what we call models. And so models lets us construct documents, get documents that fit the model, post documents or anything with documents fitting the model. So you can think of a Mongoose model as essentially a, deep, a set of like DDMS functions specific to a collection, right? So for a given collection, the, a model for that collection provides a uh, function to allow you to create, read, update, or delete documents. So to create a Mongoose mo model in general, you want to first create a schema. And to do that, we use the mongoose.schema method. And so first we want to define the schema. We want to give our schema a name. In this case, we call our schema user schema. And then we use the new keyword and then the mongoose.schema method. And inside that method, we take in one, um, one parameter, one input, and it's a JavaScript object that contains the keys which we want the data that fit the schema to have. So in this case, we want all data that follows the user schema to have these name, age, and text, and also specify what data type each of these fields must have, right? So name must be a string, age must be a number, and text must be an array of strings. 
So first, we need to define our schema by defining what uh, fields we want and what are the types that we want for each field. And the second thing that we need to do is to create a mongoose model with that schema. And we do that by using mongoose.model. And so um, to create a user model, we first define or like, give our model like a name, a variable name, and then we use the mongoose.model method. And this takes in the name of the collection and also the schema that this collection should follow. And so in this case, we call our collection user. And this user collection will follow this user schema. Right. So anything added to this user collection through mongoose must follow this schema. It must have name, age, pets, and all of these types. No more and no less. So how do we create documents in Mongoose? Right, so we can create documents by first um, creating our model and then using the new model name, the new user in this case, and giving it a um, JavaScript object that is the document that we want to add. Right? And we want to make sure that this document that we're trying to add matches the user schema defined inside here, right? It matches the model schema, right? So name must be a string, age must be a number, and text must be a uh, array of string, right? So if we have more fields or less fields, this will be rejected. And if we had um, like name, say, being like some number, then that would also be rejected. So first we need to um, create like a document by doing new user and then giving it like whatever value the document should have. But this just creates the document. It actually hasn't like added it to our database yet. And to add this like, newly created um, user document into the database, we want to do um, this 10 dot save, like right? the name of the newly created document and we call the dot save method. And optionally, like you can wait after the, um, the document has actually been saved into MongoDB, and you can like do some login. Right? This step, like this dot done step, is just saying like after you save um, this like, document into the database, um, if you want to do anything with it, you can just like log in. Right? So altogether, when we want to connect to Mongo, Mongoose and MongoDB, we first want to import Mongoose. And remember, when we're on the back end and we want to import something, instead of doing import Mongoose, we want to use the require statement. So we're saying const Mongoose equals to require Mongoose. We want to provide our SRV, which is like an identifier that allows us to identify which database or which collection we want to, um, which cluster we want to connect to. And we provide the database names and any parameters that we um, need to like further specify. And in this case, we want to put our database name in this DB name field um, in the options. And then using these, we use the mongoose.connect um, to connect to the database. And this connect um, method takes in two parameters. The first parameter being the SRV or like the connection URL, which is like our ID for like which uh, cluster to connect to, and also the JavaScript object for like the options, right? And what you could do after you connect is like you can wait till after you connect, and then you can maybe log to say that you're connected, right? So this just gives us like an idea of whether or not we're actually connected to the database, so it's easier to debug. And then once we do that, once we're connected to our database, um, then we define our schema, and we create a model for that follows that schema, right? So we create a user model that follows the user schema, which has name, um, which is a string, age, which is a number, pets, and array of string. And once we define our model, we create a new document um, that under that model using the new user or like whatever model name you come up with here. And we, as input, give it the document that we want to add. And then to actually save that new document into the database, we want to call the dot save method on this newly created document. 
And then also you can um, log things out after it's been created into MongoDB. So meanwhile on Atlas, if you again go into like collections and you go into the collection that you added the data point into, um, you can, you're supposedly able to see whatever document you just added, right? So again, to go look at data, actual data on Atlas, you just want to go onto, into the collection tab, click on the database that you're using and click on the collection that you're using. And you should be able to like find like the data point. So you can basically use like Atlas to kind of like debug or like see whether or not like your application, your web app is actually working and like adding things to the database. So this is the thing that has been added technically from that um, from the code that we went over. But hold on a second. What is this like random looking string that's here? Or what is this thing in like ID? So this underscore ID field turns out to be a unique identifier that is automatically assigned to every document. And this identifier is assigned under the underscore ID field. And this is like useful when there's like a relationship between documents. So take like our cat book for example, right? So we have our stories and we have our comments. Each comment um, stores like its parents, which is like the ID of the story that it belongs to. And this parent identifier, when we put our like comments onto MongoDB should be the underscore ID field of the story document that the comment belongs under. Right. So this underscore ID field uniquely identifies like that story that the comment belongs to. Question. No, okay. So how do we find documents using Mongoose? So we start off with our model, right? So here we're using the user model that we created and we use the dot find method. And this dot find method takes in one parameter. It takes in a JavaScript object that describes like how you want to filter the collection, right? So you can put like um, a statement to like further filter like the uh, users that you want to find. So um, in this case though, if it's like an empty object, it just like, if there's no condition, right? So this just finds all of the users. And then um, once you wait until you find all of the users and maybe you want to do something. We can also again, specify things that you want to filter on. So in this case, you specify that you want to filter on the field name and you want to filter for all users that have the name of Tim. So ignore this comment up here. Um, but yes, so there's a piece of code that find me all of the names user documents where the name is Tim. And the second one here says, find me all of the user documents where the name is Tim and the age is 21. So you can see here that to use this like um, input for the dot find method, you want to specify the field that you are filtering with and the value that you want your resulting documents to have. And when you want to filter on multiple fields, you just put them all in the same object. And basically when you have multiple fields that you have to filter on, it's like an and relationship, right? It's not, this is not like finally all the users who has the name of Tim or have our age 20. It's finally all the users who have the name of Tim and are 21 years old. Right, so this is like an and. And again, you can add as many parameters as you want to be filtered which will turn out to be quite useful. And so how do we delete documents from Mongoose? There's actually two ways for us to delete documents. Um, the first being the uh, delete one method, right? So we use the model and we call it delete one. And this basically deletes the first user in the collection with the name of Tim, right? So it deletes one document that satisfies whatever like, condition is inside the parameter. So you provide the delete method with a object, which has like the 
um, condition uh, in which you want to delete the object. So in this case, we want to delete one document where the name is Tim. The field name is Tim. But there's also another delete method, right? Like what if you want to delete all of the documents where the name is Tim? Then there's the, the delete many method, right? So you do that by doing like the model name, in this case, user dot delete many. And again, you provide it with a object where you specify the field and the values. So like whatever condition um, you want for the documents to delete. So this line just means that delete all of the users in the user collection where the name is Tim. So since that was, this would delete all of the um, documents, you want to be kind of careful while using delete many. So you want to actually be sure that you actually are deleting what you want to delete, right? And you're not deleting like more information than you need to. Question? No, no, okay. So um, again, the mongoose structure. So our server via the api.js file calls the use, um, user operations. So it utilizes the operations provided by the module. It is actually this model that talks to our user collection in the database. And it, it, like there's a stacking, like, um, et cetera. So again, you can think of like each model being like, a um, database management system for a specific collection in the database, right? So our models allow us to um, do things to the collection, whether it's adding new documents, um, reading documents, deleting documents, or updating documents, right? And each model, again, is specific for a given collection in a web database. And each model follows a schema. And so if you want to learn more about like um, schema types or uh, more about models like validation, and if you want to read more about like, um, or you want to read like the guide, feel free to check out any of these links.